Well, good morning, church. How are you today? It's good to see you. It's good to meet new people today. That's always fun. So I want to just say welcome to you. My name is Kay. If you're visiting, I'm one of the pastors here. We are so glad you're here. We are in the middle of a series called The Way. We've been looking at stories from the Gospel of Luke about what it really means for us to follow Jesus. So just to catch you up, we've already looked at what it means to prepare the way, to live in the way of the Spirit, to live the way of the kingdom, and today we're going to be talking about the way of love. And so that theme, the way of love, could really encompass anything about following Jesus, of course, but you'll see where I'm headed as we get into our story this morning. Last week, we were in Luke chapter 6, in this famous sermon, this message that Jesus gives about what it would look like if we actually live in the way of the kingdom, how things would be different for us. And then at the end of the message, Jesus looks at the people who are listening, and he talks about this idea of seeing clearly. It's really important for us to see clearly what actually doing the words of Jesus would look like, and not only that, but to see ourselves clearly at how we're doing in that. Are we reflecting God's glory? Are we making Jesus known for how we're doing? We need to see clearly. And so then, interestingly, this theme of seeing is something that you can find all throughout, especially the Gospels, because do you know, church, that Jesus, God in the flesh, is all about revelation? And revelation merely means for us to see, for something to be unveiled, for us to finally perceive it. And so God in the flesh was Jesus, coming to show us what God is like, his character, his action. And so in Luke 10, which is where we're going to be today, and there's notes in your program if you want to follow along there, in Luke 10, the story just before the one we're going to read today is Jesus sending out 72 disciples, and he sends them out, and they get to see amazing things. He sends them out to preach the gospel and heal and cast out demons, and they come back so excited. And Jesus basically looks at them and says, Let's remember what's most important here. It's what God is doing and how you get to be a part of it. And then he said in verse uh, 1023, Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. This idea that he went on to explain to them that kings and prophets of the olden days longed to see what they were seeing, something new revealed in Jesus. And so he's saying, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. And you know, church, this is for us today too. Blessed are you to get to see what you see revealed in God. And so today we're going to be in a story that some of you have probably heard a couple times before, to put it mildly. But let's pray together right now that God would help us see something new today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. Lord, I'm grateful because it encourages me, it guides me, it challenges me, it forms me. Lord, it reveals who you are and what you're calling me into. And so today, God, for my friends in this room, I pray that you would help each one see clearly what your word is for them today. What this story means to them on August 18th, 2019 that you would bring them a fresh revelation of this time that they live in, of this season that they're entering, God, and that you would do a new thing in us with it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this story starts, uh, we're going to be in 1025, and Luke just kind of switches gears and starts telling a new story. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Luke gives us right from the get-go that this guy is all about testing Jesus. And he tells us that he's an expert in the law. And so perhaps he thinks he's on equal footing with Jesus. Maybe he sees Jesus as this teacher that people are following, and he's got a lot of knowledge. So maybe he's someone that is a worthy challenger. And that's the first mistake, of course, right? And then he asked them about, asked Jesus about inheriting eternal life. What must I do? And for a lot of people, this is a confusing kind of thing to say because we understand that salvation doesn't come by works. It's by grace through our faith. And yet, one of the ways we can think about this statement is basically this expert in the law, this lawyer, is looking at Jesus and saying, 
how do I know I get the rewards of my righteousness? Because people living under the law are very concerned about righteousness, as we all should be. But there's going to be quite a twist, right? So Jesus knows what this guy is up to. He knows the thoughts and intentions of our hearts and minds. And yet, he looks at the man and says, in verse 26, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And I always remember this as such a good example, church, for when people are trying to debate with us or trick us or trap us, you know what a really good strategy is? Just listen. Just listen. Jesus doesn't try to defend himself or explain himself. Instead, he tries to draw out, how does this man understand the law? And so in verse 27, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So this legal expert answers wisely, and he takes his answer from two different places in the law. The first one, you wouldn't have had to be an expert to know, because every faithful Jew was supposed to recite the Shema every day. And that is what we find at the beginning of it. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, when Moses was about to lead a new generation into the Promised Land. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 3, Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Now, this is the part that they would have been reciting daily. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And so clearly there's a recognition here that the heart of the law was always about relational connection. It was always about God having a people and the people being able to say, that's my God. And there would be this loving relationship but then also, the lawyer adds on, love your neighbor as yourself. This is a command that comes from the book of Leviticus, this place that's kind of in a long, to us, from our perspective, might look like a lot of random commands, like what kind of fabric you're allowed to sew together and wear, what you should plant in your field, which animals you're allowed to breed together, and then this, Leviticus 19.18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. So as this lawyer, as this legal expert puts together these two ideas, what he's really doing is representing the Ten Commandments and encapsulating that, right? The first five of the Ten Commandments are about our relationship with God, loving him with all that we are, serving him only, and then the second five are about our relationship with people. And so, indeed, he's answered with a lot of insight. He knows something about the law. And Jesus, when he's asked in other places in the gospel, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus gives basically this very same answer, right? So he's answered well. And although Jesus knows his motives, he commends him in verse 28. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Well, it's the difference between knowing something and doing something, isn't it? This is where the trouble begins for the legal expert. Jesus challenges him, do this. And this is the same thing we saw last week. It's not just a matter of hearing my words, but it's doing them and practicing them. That really glorifies me and changes your life. And so Jesus is looking at this man, commending him for his answer, but also putting a challenge in front of him. And that challenge is merely... Go do this. Do this, and you will receive the rewards of righteousness. He's saying to him, in essence, live the law of love, not by the letter of the law. And this is our main idea for today. Live the law of love, not the letter of the law. So, of course, a, a lawyer would know the letter of the law. He has the knowledge. He has the expertise. But Jesus is saying there's something that truly fulfills all this law that you've spent so much time memorizing and teaching and trying to adhere to. Because the law was always intended for people to understand their need for forgiveness. The law was always about us seeing that we would never be able to keep up, we would never be able to perform perfectly, and we need a Savior. And so the fulfillment of the law was in the sacrifice of Christ. 
This is one of the blessed things that we get to see from our side of history. And so Jesus is talking to him about loving God in action. And one of the things that you'll probably hear me say a lot in this series, you may have caught it several times, is just this truth, that God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't just abstractly loved us, love us, but he actively loves us and loved us to the cross. And so now he's calling us to love people that way. Live out the law of love, not by the letter of the law. In Galatians 5, Paul wrote this. He wrote, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. What does that mean? That in Christ we have freedom from condemnation under the law. We no longer are bound up and sentenced to death because of the law that we can't keep. Right? This is the good news. He said, you're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And so the fulfillment of the law in Christ to us, and then the only way that we truly can fulfill the law of God is in love. Right? This is so important to us in our heritage where, where sanctification and holiness is about love, and that's the filter that we use. In Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, Paul wrote, Let no debt remain outstanding, because we've been forgiven of our debts. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. But the lawyer knows the letter of the law, doesn't he? And what Jesus realizes is that this man, although he has insight into the law, he doesn't have adherence to the heart of the law. So there's a big difference. And right here, I say this also quite a bit, that in the scripture, when you see the words, but, it's always really important. There's some contrast that's going to teach us something or help us understand. And here you see a but, a human being. When the statement is, but God, it's usually good news. When it's a but man, it's often not so good. And so here, the lawyer, having been commended for his answer, but then challenged to go and do it, it says in verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So it seems that he's looking, according to the letter of the law, to find some kind of loophole, some kind of way that he doesn't have to be responsible for loving everybody. So this is our first takeaway for today. Stop looking for loopholes and lead instead with love. Isn't it so easy for us to rationalize and to justify and to try to find a loophole why I don't actually need to love that enemy? I don't actually need to bless those who curse me. I don't actually need to turn the other cheek. I have rights. There's so many reasons why it's easy for us to try to find a loophole around these words that Jesus gives in so many different places in the scripture. The lawyer is looking for qualifications. He wants to know, who is my neighbor? Who are the ones that I don't have to bother with? And who are the ones that I should go love? And he may actually be adhering to the letter of the law because if you caught it in Leviticus 19, there is a little phrase that says, among your people. And so perhaps he's living according to that letter of the law that I don't really have to love everybody, just the ones who are already my people. And so Jesus, at this point, the door has been opened. He basically says, game on. I'm about to school you in what it means to love this way and to be a true neighbor. And so... This is nothing new for situations that Jesus gets in. You know, a lot of times in the gospel stories, he has religious people and, and Pharisees and scribes who try to challenge him. They try to test him. They try to trap him with the letter of the law. 
And again and again and again, what you see is Jesus not willing to be constricted and confined by the letter of the law, but expressing to people, this is what it's like when we live the law fulfilled in loving others. And so that's where he's going. Verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So two characters so far in this story, a man that's a terrible victim of crime, beaten, bloody, naked, helpless, and then enters a priest, who according to this audience, the expectation would be this is the hero of the story. Because priests were highly esteemed and respected, priests were the only ones who got to enter the holy place and offer sacrifices for the people. Priests were actually the ones who were mediators between God and man. So this expectation that their righteousness must exceed the righteousness of others was very prevalent, was there. And so Jesus does something already that's going to make them sit up and take notice. The hero of the story is not the priest. And if you read commentary on this or you've heard other messages, which I'm pretty sure if you've been in a church, you've, you've heard some other messages on this story. And what people often like to talk about is the fact that if he would have touched the man, he would have been unclean to perform his priestly duties. And we don't know if that's true. The, the scripture doesn't tell us. It's not here in the text. But maybe that was the reason why he didn't want to approach. And even if that is the reason why, over and over again in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, God speaks, especially through his prophets, to keep telling his people, I don't want your religious activities if your heart is not in it. He says, I don't care about your sacrifices. I don't care about your fasting. I don't care about your rituals and ceremonies and traditions because your heart is far from me. In Isaiah chapter 58, it's this passage about God saying, you keep fasting, you want to seek me with fasting, but you're not doing the real kind of fast that I really desire, which is this in verse 7. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? when you see the naked, to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. So actually, this parable that Jesus is telling just parallels this statement from Isaiah, doesn't it? Because here's the priest turning away from someone who needs shelter, who needs clothing, who needs compassion and loving mercy. And yet the priest goes on his way. So whatever his motivation was, Jesus just moves on. The priest becomes a bit character in the story. Verse 32, So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So Levites, also descendants of the tribe of Levi, they're kind of like second tier to the priests. The Levites also had important duties to be performing, and it tells us in Deuteronomy 33.10, it says, he teaches your precepts to Jacob and your law to Israel. He offers incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. It was the Levite's job to be doing work around the temple, but also to be teachers of the law, which means he too would have been just as aware of these same commands that the lawyer cited at the front of the story. He would have been aware, and yet... Perhaps he's so focused on his religious duties that he doesn't stop to show compassion. And I think there are lots of times where we're so focused on church stuff and what church is doing that we miss the people right in front of us that need Jesus' love and compassion. It's a situation that hasn't changed too much. But when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that Jesus was interrupted time and time again on the way to do ministry, to do something powerful out of love and mercy for someone. And so, church, we need to keep our eyes open for the ways that God gives us these opportunities. But I think when I was praying over this story again and again this week, what really occurred to me is sometimes I might just not see the opportunity, I might miss it, 
But what's even more convicting to me is when I see it and I choose to ignore it. And maybe I see it and I choose to ignore it because it seems like a really messy situation. I don't know how to fix it, so I'm just not going to go close. Maybe I choose to ignore it because this would have been a really dangerous road, and clearly other people got attacked and beaten. So I don't want to risk myself to help someone else. Or maybe I'm really worried about guilt by association. Like, what if somebody sees me with the naked guy in the ditch? And then what are they going to think? And I think at different points, just being totally honest and transparent, I have used all of those justifications to not move towards someone in love. I used to drive to my office at my previous church, past a corner that had homeless people on it all the time. And I can tell you, there were days when I felt not every day, but days where I felt the Holy Spirit nudge me, turn around. And there were days that I listened, and I turned around and I bought food or I had a conversation. And there were days where I just went on my way because I was so busy doing religious things, being holy but not actually being holy. There were other times when I did have to think about, as a leader in the church, what does this look like for my、uh, reputation? I guess, and so. A few years ago, I got a phone call from a friend, and she said, "Hey, someone just posted about you online."、And、I said, "Oh, really? What was it?" Well, she said that you were her mentor, and I said, "Oh, yeah. Who was it?" And she told me, and I said, "Oh, I did do some mentoring with her. I had lost touch with her for a little while." And she said, "Well, I'm going to send you what was written so you can see." And because of an unfortunate grammatical construction, what it actually said was. Pastor Kay Coldy is my mentor, and I am learning bud trimming at Joe's Pot Shop. <laughs> so I didn't know very much about marijuana sales, but what I gathered was she had a job processing marijuana for sale, and it looked like I was the one mentoring her in how to do it. <laughs> and so immediately, I just had this sinking feeling in my stomach, like, oh my goodness, that needs to. Get off of there! That needs to come down.、Um, what will people think? Here's a really good letter of the law thing that we sometimes do. Like, I don't want to be someone else's stumbling block. Have you ever used that one as a loophole to not approach somebody who needs love and compassion? And so, I was really ready to track her down. I figured I could find her and ask her to remove that statement. And she was always very respectful. And I thought. She probably would do that for me, so that it doesn't look bad. And then, as I contemplated finding her, I thought, okay, I remember her story. I met her at a homeless shelter, and she was coming to a Bible study. And after Bible study, she started asking me all these questions, and I could tell she was really confused about the truth of who God is and and what Jesus has done for us. And so I said, hey, would you want to go out for coffee? And she said, I would love that. And so I started picking her up for coffee from time to time, and right away she told me her story, which involved such terrible things, such terrible, terrible things, and things that made me understand why she would be very confused about the nature of God because of some of the things that she'd experienced, and then that led to poor choices, and she was out of prison. And so one time in one of our conversations. I remember her saying, "I've never known anybody who doesn't want something from me. I've never had a mentor before. I've never had somebody who just wanted to help me." And I just thought, "Man, I don't really know how to help you <laughs> because this is such a mess." But I'm going to share the love of Jesus with you. And after several weeks, she understood. She decided she wanted to be baptized, and she did come to our church to be baptized. And it was this awesome thing. And then she moved out of the shelter, and I lost track of her until this. And so there I am, faced with this: okay, what do I do? Do I ask her to take this off? And what Holy Spirit really impressed on me was: if I go to her and say, "Please don't tell people that I'm your mentor," all I'm doing is heaping more shame on her. 
and that the loving thing to do would be to find her and just say, "How are you doing? How are you doing?" Um, so in Washington State, pot shops were legal. This was like her first legal job in a long time. So in her mind, she was on the right track. She was clean from drugs, and I just encouraged her and loved her. But it was one of those chances where I had the opportunity: Do I move towards her in love, or do I keep my distance because I'm too worried about myself here? So not every time have I made the right choice, but that was one of those times that just. Blessed me to know that God would use me, and church, God will use you, because there's nothing special about me. God will use you if you make yourself available to people. So Jesus, looking at what the priest and Levite had done, he's now going to introduce another character. Right? They had seen the man and avoided him for whatever their reason might be. We're not totally sure, but verse 33. Now Jesus throws a butt in the story. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. This is a huge plot twist for the people listening. They despise the Samaritans. They consider them sinners. They've been enemies of the Jews, basically. In the previous chapter, just in Luke chapter nine, his disciples are sent ahead into Samaria to prepare for Jesus, and they're rejected. By the Samaritans, and so two of Jesus' twelve look at Jesus and say, "Hey, should we call down fire from heaven on them?" These are two of the men that just heard Jesus preach, "Love your enemies, <laughs> bless those who curse you." And so his own disciples have such a deep-seated belief and feeling about the Samaritans that even they can't see this idea that maybe they're the neighbor. And Jesus puts it right in the parable, and it's a plot twist for sure. Goes on and says in verse 34, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So instead of just feeling some compassion or thinking about being compassionate, the Samaritan was the one who acted on loving compassion. The Samaritan is the one who takes action. Look in these two verses, right here, 34 and 35. Look at the verbs. This is what we call just observing to have an understanding of what's going on. If you look at the verbs, it says he went, he bandaged, he poured on, he put him, he brought him, he took care of him. He took out money. He gave it, and then he said, "I will return, and I will reimburse." This is someone taking action to show compassion in love. And so, this is our second takeaway for today: recognize and respond to opportunities to love your neighbor. Unlike the priest and the Levite, who it tells us they saw the man and went the other way, the Samaritan moved towards him. Took action at personal expense and risk. So there's a book, actually two books that have been、um, really encouraging to me. They're written by a man named Bob Goff. Has anybody read a Bob Goff book? A few people. So、um, Bob Goff has two books called. Well, the first one was Love Does, and the second one is Everybody Always. And the second one I would definitely say is better written. It's not as if. Um, he's striving to be some incredible author. He's not a theologian. He's not a pastor. What he is is a man who has basically gone on a mission to encourage and call the church to take action with their love, to move, to do something with it, to serve, to dream, to help, to to just go towards other people. And he writes, and love does. He says that's because love is never stationary. In the end, love doesn't just keep thinking about it or keep planning for it. Simply put, love does. Friends, I've been part of churches for a while now, and I can tell you, I've spent a lot of time creating some very detailed plans on how to love people, while probably missing tons of opportunities with people that were right in front of me, needing to be loved. Some of us do that with our own family members. All sorts of things that we're, we're planning on doing and thinking about doing, and there's people right in front of us, or right across the hall from us, 
that just need to be loved. So instead of getting caught up, tied up in the letter of the law, when you don't know what to do with someone, maybe the step to take is just love them somehow. You don't need a ten-point plan for that. So Jesus has totally set up this lawyer now to have to swallow his pride, hasn't he? He's going to have to swallow his pride and answer this question. Jesus says in verse 36, "Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers?" So remember the question that Jesus was asked. He was asked, "Who is my neighbor?" Because this lawyer was all about figuring out who's in and who's out. Who do I have to count as a person that I should love? And instead of talking about who do you have to count, instead Jesus wants him to learn how to be a neighbor. He changes the question. So in verse 37, the expert in the law replied, "The one who had mercy on him." Jesus told him, "Go and do likewise." For those of you who heard last week in Jesus's message, part of that conclusion was, "Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful." This is love expressed to people. Take action with that kind of mercy, and so. The lawyer declares, "Yes, it's the Samaritan who had mercy," and Jesus is looking at him, bringing him something entirely new and different. Because the old way for the Jews, for the people of God, the old way was what's now an old wine skin, the old covenant. But Jesus is bringing them a new wine skin for a new covenant of grace, where we fulfill the law by being love in action, the way Jesus did on our behalf. This is our righteousness. So, one of the things that really occurred to me this week, as I spent more time just reading and rereading what was a familiar story, is that Jesus here is teaching this expert in the law about what mercy looks like. Right? He's using the Samaritan as an example. This is called an example parable. Very often, he's teaching him what this kind of living the law of love would look like. But at the same time, he's showing us what the love of God looks like, isn't he? Because church, I was once the person on the side of the road, pretty messed up, broken, ashamed, not able to help myself, and yet the love of God was moving towards me and taking action. God didn't just look at me and say, "When you get yourself cleaned up and ready to go, when you fix it all." I'll be down the road, and this is the kind of love that we get to see, that we get to experience, and it's the kind of love that we get to share with people. This is the way of love if we're really going to follow Jesus. The other thing that I noticed about this story when I was getting to the conclusion, Jesus teaches him what mercy looks like, what the love of God actually is like, but he doesn't just teach him about it. He doesn't just Tell him what mercy would be like. Jesus actually shows him mercy. Do you know why Jesus shows the lawyer mercy? Because he could have just smacked the guy down in judgment, couldn't he? He was wrong. He had bad intentions. He wasn't living out the way of love. But instead, Jesus responds with such great mercy. Jesus just looks at him and says, "Go and do likewise." This is part of the mercy of God that we're always invited. No matter what we've been doing, we're always invited to step into the way of love. So Jesus demonstrates this mercy also to the lawyer, to the expert in the law. And next week we're going to hear quite a bit about Jesus' warnings to the Pharisees. But all of that warning comes in the context where Jesus didn't stop having dinner with the Pharisees. He didn't stop moving towards them and issuing the invitation and inviting them to be free from the works of the law and step into the way of Jesus. So, for some of us, maybe we have a really hard time approaching people who are just kind of a mess and very obvious sin. Maybe it is because we don't want to be considered unclean. We don't want to ruin our reputations. We don't want to take risks. But then, for others of us, do you know the people that are hardest to move toward are the legalists, the people who seem to be lacking in grace and mercy, the ones who probably know the rules the best but don't seem very loving. 
But Jesus never stopped moving towards those people. And so for us, whichever side of the coin you find yourself facing, the answer for us is live out the law of love. We can recognize and respond to every opportunity in front of us, whether it's being called to the person who's a cranky legalist or being called to the person who's kind of a mess and struggling and broken, or maybe just experiencing circumstances in the world that have left them broken. So as the worship team comes back out, we're going to have response time together. This is what J.D. Walt said. He said this story of the Good Samaritan. This is not a question of who is my neighbor. The big question is, how do I be a neighbor? In a stroke of divine irony, this story shows us that the natural heirs of the kingdom, in the parable, that's the religious people, least resemble the righteousness of God, and the avowed enemies of the heirs of the kingdom are lifted up as the exemplars of God's righteousness. Church, we are now the heirs of the kingdom. We're the one that gets to receive the rewards of righteousness. And God looks at us and calls us to righteousness through loving people and loving him. And so today in response, maybe your response, we've been saying the altar is open, and you're welcome to come up here for any reason. You need any kind of prayer from someone else or with someone, you can come up and pray by yourself. But I think part of our powerful response this morning might just be to acknowledge and give thanks to a God who has always moved towards you whenever you're hurting, whenever you're broken. Maybe today it's a day that you need to actually say, yes, Jesus, I recognize you've been moving toward me and I need to give my life back to you. If that's you today, if there's that feeling, don't begrudge it. Come forward and pray. And if you need any other prayer, healing prayer, the altar is open. Let's use this time to really be in the presence of God and respond to his word. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, Lord, that you love us like this, like a perfect version of the Samaritan who comes to us in our need and our brokenness. Lord, you're willing to pick us up, to give us shelter under your wings, to heal us. God, you spared no expense on us with the life of your son. So, Lord, we just respond in gratitude and we ask you, Holy Spirit, show us the people that we need to move toward. And show us the way in, in whatever situations we have in our lives, Lord, to take a step in love. Not overthink it but know that we're being like you. We pray this in your name. Amen.